Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today I know this is very much delayed since this pack really came out in December on the 13th of uh, December but I'm getting to it now anyway because I've got lots of other mod things to cover and I want to go through this as well because there's a lot of really cool additions to the Grasslands uh, animal pack so this came out on the 13th of December and added 12 new animals so there's five species of butterflies that they've added in there and they'll get to along with a few other really really cool species that we'll get stuck uh, into and start talking about and today we're going to be starting off with the butterflies in here we're going to have a look at the cloudless sulfur so that's kind of the name of the species here let me grab one and see if I can find one and uh, talk about it camera so look, here we got a nice cloudless sulfur. Let's see if we can find one flying around or sitting around like that. Look at these cute little guys. So these guys are in their own kind of group of butterflies uh, called Peridae. They're from the Americas. So this species has actually got quite a wide range and ranges from South America to Southern Canada and particularly can be found in Ontario as well. And the most common range is from Argentina to uh, Texas and Florida, places like that. But they are occasional visitors up north, so they do have they pretty much range across most of the Americas. And in terms of their habitat, these guys are uh, typically found in open spaces, uh, water courses, uh, seashores, and glades. So lots of uh, humid areas that are kind of um, humid that are flat and open. And um, there's a few other species uh, uh, related to these guys, such as the yellow angered sulfur. But these guys are kind of the largest of the group. So in terms of their diet, these guys typically feed on nectar, like most other butterflies. And they have many different flowers with these long tubes that include like uh, hibiscus flowers and wild morning glory flowers. And the larvae actually will feed on uh, partridge peas and sienas as well. And during, the, speaking of their life cycle, the breeding season is typically dependent on the climate of the area. Uh, they can typically be found between uh, midsummer to fall in cooler areas, but they can breed year round in uh, warmer climates. And as an egg, they lay kind of six, uh, these, they, uh, can't even speak properly. They lay these white eggs that they put on a plant and eventually they turn pale orange and it typically takes about six days for them to hatch. And once these uh, little caterpillars hatch, uh, the yellowish green with striped sides along the back as well. And the host plant is typically the partridge pea, uh, clovers and things like that. And the caterpillar will usually grow to about 41 to 45 millimeters or about 1.6 to 1.8 inches long and they'll enter a chrysalis like most other butterflies uh, and it'll be yellow green or pink with green stripes and out come the adult butterfly which measures about uh, 55 to 70 millimeters or 2.2 to 2.8 inches wide let's have a look at another one see if we can find one flying let's look at that one flying there really really cute so once they get that adult stage the ma uh, the male butterfly is kind of clear yellow and uh, or yellow or malted with reddish browns below and the female is kind of a lemon gold or golden white on both surfaces so there's a little bit of sexual dimorphism between them with varying amounts of spots and things like that across its uh, wings and um, typical wingspan for these guys is about 63 to 78 millimeters or 2.5 to 3 inches so a medium sized butterfly not incredibly huge but still really really cool so let's have a look at the uh, uh, Superior for these guys. So they're found in temperate areas, parks, grasslands, watercourses, and seashores. Uh, they're also considered least concerned. They're still quite a common butterfly. Really, really awesome. You can see that range there. So huge. So you can found from Argentina all the way up to the USA and southern parts of Canada. Uh, you can see their group size 1 to 90. They have no dominance. Uh, they're polygamous, so they pretty much go around um, doing their thing. Size 6.5, uh, 6.65 meter wingspan with a life expectancy of about 9 months with an unknown weight. They reach their sexual maturity about 1.5 months. They can have uh, sex till they die. They have 3 to 6 babies per offspring uh, mating event with 0 months gestation and a 120 month into birth period. And they're quite okay to breed in captivity. So let's see effects about these guys. These guys are a migratory butterfly with populations from the USA often traveling to Mexico the Caribbean to overwinter. Uh, when migrating, they can travel up to 20 kilometers in a day, so that's pretty interesting. They've often been observed feeding in the mud. It is thought this may be a, sort of so a source of salt for the butterfly, so that's another interesting fact. The chrysalis of the cloudless sulfur um, looks like a leaf, and the pupa inside will wriggle when touched to scare off predators. And the eggs of the cloudless sulfur are pure white when first laid, but become yellowy-orange as it approaches hatching, so that's true. 
and you can see the other species of uh, butterflies that they can share with. So that's kind of it on the uh, cloudless sulfur. Next, we're moving up to the European peacock or the peacock butterfly. So let's have a look at these guys here. Uh, let's uh, have a look at the camera. So these are really, really pretty guys. So these guys, also known as the peacock butterfly, the European peacock, these guys are quite a colorful butterfly. And they're found in Europe and temperate Asia. They can be found as far east as Japan. And they're the only member of their genus, um, Icarus, I believe you say that, or Iowa, the daughter of Icarus, I believe you say that. I'm not an expert on Greek mythology, so I don't know too much. Uh, the peacock butterfly is resident in most of its range, though it winters uh, in buildings and trees. And they therefore often appeared quite early in spring. And the peacock butterfly has uh, figured in research where the roles of eye spots kind of be, because it's got these really beautiful uh, eye spots there that people think, well, what are these for? So in terms of its characteristics, these guys have a wingspan of about 50 to 55 millimeters. The base color of the wing there, as you can see, is quite a rusty red, but they have the distinctive tip and with blue uh, and yellow eye spots there. And um, the underside, as you can see, is much more cryptic brown, things like that. But really, really cool regardless. I think that's so awesome. In terms of its natural history, these guys are also like open areas. They can be found in woods, fields, meadows, parks, and gardens from low limbs up to 2,500 meters or 8,000 feet elevation. And they're a relatively common butterfly seen in a lot of European areas. And the pe male peacock uh, exhibits kind of very territorial behaviors. So they may create territories and uh, be selective of where these females will come and lay their eggs so they kind of protect these uh, sites. Um, and the, these guys will also hibernate over winter before laying their eggs in the early spring, where they'll lay, lay up to about 400 at a time. The eggs are ribbed olive green and laid under the undersides of uh, nestle plants and then and hops. And then the caterpillars, which are shiny black with... Uh, Six rows of barb spikes will kind of do their thing and eat around the chrysalis. And the chrysalis may actually, when they turn into that chrysalis, may be grey, dark brown, or green in colour. And um, the caterpillars can get quite large at about 42 millimetres in length. Um, adult butterflies, uh, though, once they uh, come out of the chrysalis and do their thing, these guys uh, will feed on a wide variety of plants like clovers, dandelions, willows, things like that, clovers. And also will eat rotten fruits and uh, tree sap. And really interesting about these guys is that these are monogamous butterflies. So they've got a very interesting ecology to them. Let's see if we can find one. Let's see, they're very pretty. But um, these guys are monogamous, so they only mate with one partner for a period of time. And this is due to their life cycle because they overwinter. So what happens is a male will find a territory and hold it. And the territories are usually determined like the best territories are kind of where the female has the best place to lay her eggs. So that's a really, really interesting thing about these guys. And they'll often defend these, uh, they'll have preaching behaviors and they'll perch on objects uh, where they can find it. Say, hey, this is my area. And each time a passing object of their own species, they will fly straight towards it until they're about approximately 10 centimeters away. So kind of be like bluff charge them pretty much. And then when the female, when they come to a female, he'll pursue the female until she lands and mating will occur. And then they'll kind of do their thing. And this uh, monoandrous kind of system has caused the, uh, shorter, caused the evolution of shorter lifespans in the peacocks. So in polygamous butterflies, they tend to uh, live a lot longer. Therefore, the longer a male lives, the more it can reproduce and has a higher fitness. So since these guys are much more monogamous, they typically have a shorter life. And um, a lot of things, these guys, even though they hibernate, they have many different um, anti-predator defense mechanisms, like these large eye spots. And... Um, they often can be used to track many birds that attack them, and it's like eye mimicry, which is really, really cool. And um, even with rodents, uh, they can, these uh, eye spots can be ineffective, but they have a much stronger reverse reaction because they make a hissing sound to scare off rodents. So that's really, really interesting. So yeah, another really cool butterfly. Let's see if you can find one's flying around. There we are, wonderful cutie. Don't know what he's doing there, but have a look at you. Gotta be one flying around. There we are. Look at them flying around. Very, very cute. So let's look at the uh, Zupedia. Pretty much covers what we said. They live throughout the woodlands of Europe and Asia. Uh, least concern, they're found around Europe, but they can be found in Ch Japan as well. Pretty much any temperate area across that. I think their range could be greatly extended. Uh, 1 to 90. Males are territorial, and again, they're monogamous. A little bit small, about 5.5 centimeter wingspan and they live for a year and weight is unknown uh 
their sexual maturity is 1.5 months, they can have sex till they die, uh, three to six uh, offspring per mating event, zero month incubation on 20 month average. I think they're pretty much all the same. So in fact, these guys can make a hissing noise uh, that is audible to humans by rubbing their wings together, which is used to ward off rodents, as I mentioned. Uh, the uh, European butterfly, uh, peacock butterfly's wing pattern is a defense mechanism with the eye spots looking like a bird's eye and beak to scare off predators. Many of the caterpillars of the European peacock butterfly fall victim to parasitic wops, wasps, which sucks as cause. And in Japan, these guys are a positive symbol of a happy marriage. That's another cool thing about these guys. People like to view them positively. And the underside of a European peacock's wings are camouflaged to look like a dead leaf. This comes in especially useful when they hibernate throughout the winter. And they can be seen with other species, as we can kind of see there. So yeah, really, really awesome. So next up, we've got our last butterfly um, for the day before we get into the habitat species. We've got the blue morpho butterfly. So let's have a look at these guys here. Let's uh, get us looking at these guys. Look at this cutie and how beautiful is that? Love seeing butterflies. So the uh, blue morpho or the melanus blue morpho, these are one of the 30 species of butterfly in this family Morphidae. Uh, this species in particular has a wingspan that's approximately about 12 centimeters and because they're quite big. And um, they have these iridescent uh, blue edges with um, black, I can't even speak right, these uh, blue wings with like these black edges on them that look really, really beautiful. And they're actually quite a charismatic species of butterfly and quite valued among collectors. Uh, in terms of its range, these guys are a tropical species of butterfly that can be found in Central and South America, across like Brazil, Mexico, Venezuela, and even being discovered in um, the Andean region as well, which is quite cool. And um, in terms of behavior, these guys will typically inhabit the understories uh, and perch on tree stumps. They can be found uh, near treetops uh, uh, when it's time to lay eggs. And both sexes have a slow and floppy flight pattern, and they'll feed on rotting fruits that drop to the ground. Males tend to fly in open clearings high and high in the canopy, and the butterflies will co uh, collectively emerge in the beginning of the wet season in the Cerrado. And they do not appear in the middle of the wet season because of the heavy rains can damage their wings. And the emergence uh, it depends on the availability of food, which depends on climate as well. And to protect themselves from the rain, the species prefers like small enclosed spaces. In terms of life cycle, these butterflies will lay eggs uh, one to one, one by one on the underside of a host plant. And the eggs are very small and can be pale green and start to look like little dew, dew drops. And the eggs are laid so the caterpillar may feed as soon as they hatch. And these caterpillars, they like um, all sorts of different plants, but they prefer to feed on new leaves of host plants, as these new uh, leaves are more nutritious and um, easier to eat. And the caterpillars are typically red, brown in color with these bright green spots, and they're covered in bristles that um, release an irritant upon contact. So if you touch it, it'll irritate you, and it can be quite annoying. And conversely, this is the peak. Uh, the peak of the caterpillar is in the dry season. So the, um... oh, I think it's starting to rain, is it? I think we'll turn that off. We'll inter interrupt. Anyway, we'll go back and look at this little guy. Look at you. So pretty. Uh, anyway, conversely, the peak of the caterpillar is a dry season, which is a climate which is unsuitable for most animal com uh, communities. So they typically kind of get like, hide away with things like that. And these caterpillars were into diapause or suspended development, and they can actually delay pupation. Um, in order to survive this harsh period of lack of water. And as the dry season continues, uh, the population of caterpillars declines due to pr uh, predation, of course. And um, one thing as well is that one of the best predictors of adult butterfly occurrence is uh, its activity was interactive with uh, ripe fruit. So typically the adults will merge during the wet season where the climate and air humidity makes food uh, like pretty much plentiful and um, has uh, advantages for overpositive of a position, I believe you say that. And they will spend three to four weeks as an adult, and the entire life cycle is about 115 days. Adults will fly uh, along rivers or anywhere that opens land can be revealed. And what's really cool about these guys, what really makes them distinct from other butterflies, uh, these guys have uh, these also have the eye spots, as you can see here, that are typical of a lot of other species to help deter predators. But these guys have a really interesting, as you see, the blue colors. And it's actually created by um, 
lots of uh, multi-layered uh, scales on the wing that uh, actually will reflect certain types of light to get that blue color, which is really, really interesting. It's called iridescence. And they also, uh, it also helps because it has a hydrophobic surface. So any dirt or dust will um, on the wing will actually come off because the, basically the little scales kind of repel all the water off it, which is really, really cool. And um, it's a really, really cool species. I'm definitely a big fan of these butterflies. So let's uh, have a look at the Zoopedia. Let's see if we can find one flying though before we uh, move on. There we are, I have one flying. Very much a cutie. But anyway, let's uh, have a look at the Zoopedia. So Blue Morpho, they're found in Central and South America, as I mentioned. Pretty much their range. Um, the 1 to 90, uh, they're solitary, and they don't have a dominance hierarchy, they're also polygamous as well. 12 centimeter wingspan, so they're quite a bit bigger than the other species that we've displayed here. Uh, about 4 months lifespan, and we don't really know their weights, as unknown. Age of sexual maturity is about 3 months, they can have sex if they die. 3 to 6 babies, 0 months gestation, and um, interbirth period 120 months. And their average to breeding captivity. So, in terms of their... Uh, facts, you can see they mainly feed on fermented fruit, and, the and it's been suggested that these guys can intoxicate the butterflies, so these kind of uh, fermenting fruits, and that makes them fly slow and clumsy, so it's quite funny. The Melopnus blue morpho is named after the mythological king of Sparta, um, Melognus, I believe you say that, who started the Trojan War. Uh, the blue uh, morpho caterpillar does not spin a cocoon like other species. Uh, a butterfly, but instead it grows a cuckoo shell under its, its skin, which is pretty cool. Uh, the wings of the Malignus uh, blue morpho butterfly are highly iridescent and have been researched by scientists here. They can replicate it uh, technologically, which is pretty cool. And they can fly in the rain due to the hydrophobic nature of its wings, as we mentioned. So that's pretty cool. And they can obviously share their habitats with other types of butterfly. And just look how pretty they are. It's nice to see the big ones. And I like the other sizes are different as well. You can kind of see the different sizes so these guys are kind of the big bad ones which is always awesome but now we're going to be moving on to some habitat animals so we're going to be going off to the lands of australia so we've got here we have the um red neck wallaby also known as the burnett's wallaby so these guys are a medium sized uh kind of marsupial or macropod so the type of wallaby they're typically found in p fertile parts in the eastern australia but they have been introduced to places such as New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the Isle of Man in France and Germany. So these guys are distinguished by their kind of black paws and the white stripe of the upper lip. And they've got this uh, medium grey coat with kind of this uh, reddish wash around their shoulders, which get their name the Redneck Wallaby. They can get a decent size. They get about 13 to 18 kilograms, or about 30 to 41 pounds, and attain a head to body length of about 90 centimeters, or about 35 inches. Although males are generally a little bit larger than females, uh, red neck wallabies are very similar appearance to the black stripe wallaby, with the main difference being that uh, they lack a black stripe down their neck. And these guys can live for about nine years. In terms of the habitat, they can be found across uh, eastern Australia and Queensland and Tasmania as well. And many islands of the Bass Strait that can be found on. And um, the numbers have actually expanded over the past 30 years due to redu uh, reduction in uh, hunting pressures, things like that. So they're doing a little bit better. And um, the partial clearing of forests has also helped because these guys are more of a grassland species. And they can come graze at night, things like that. In terms of their uh, behavior, these guys are typically solitary, but will gather in groups when there's abundance of food, water, and shelter. And they have a social hierarchy with... Um, and they're also able to uh, kind of uh, demonstrate uh, wallabies as they have those gregarious mammals. They can also uh, manage conflict via reconciliation. So when they fight each other, they'll often come up and like kind of uh, kind of affirm each other and things like that. So it's like, hey, I know I beat you up, but it's okay. It's okay. It's just is what it is. And these guys are mainly nocturnal and they spend most of their daytime sleeping. Uh, a female's estrus it lasts about 33 days, and during courting, the female will lick the male's neck, and the male will rub his cheek and get the female, and then they'll uh, fight briefly, and then they will mate. And the female will bear one offspring at the time, or about 280 uh, days. Uh, the young will stay in the pouch for about 280 days, where the offspring stay together for uh, only about a month. However, the female may actually stay in the home range of their mother, while male babies will leave about the age of two. 
And also these guys can also engage in allopatric care, alloparental care, I mean. So another individual may adopt a child of another individual, which is quite interesting. And it's a common behavior seen in animals like uh, elephants, wolves, humans, and fathead minnows. In terms of their diet, these guys are uh, typically grass roots, leaves, and weeds. They eat things like that. In terms of their subspecies as well, there's kind of a couple subspecies. The Burnett's wallaby refers to the kind of wallabies that you find on the Bass Strait Islands in Tasmania. The red-necked wallaby is the ones that you find on mainland Australia, and also the common name for the species. And as I mentioned, they've been introduced to places such as New Zealand uh, for hunting, and they're also, obviously, people want to get rid of them because they're pests. Uh, also, there's small colonies in uh, England and uh, Isle of Man and in France and Germany, and it's kind of bad because they're an invasive species and introduced, but still cool to see them survive out their range, and I really do like these uh, wallabies. I think they're very, very cute. So let's have a look at their... Uh, have a look at the baby, little baby here, and look at this little cutie. So now we'll look at their Zoopedia. Let's have a looky loo. So unknown yet, yeah, we've mainly talked about all that. As you see their range there around Queensland, things like that. They like the groups up to about 30, uh, with 29 males, 29 females. Batch the groups 1 to 30. And dominance is based on size, uh, denotes first choice of mates and uh, forage spots. So the, basically the biggest one gets to get the pick of the litter. They're promiscuous and confident with humans and guests get into the habitats. So males are a little bit larger. You can see males are 84 centimeters tall, females are 73. Both live about the same age of 17 years. Males are a little bit larger as well at 21 kilograms. And females are about 13 kilograms, which is all right. And um, age of sexual maturity, 1.5 years. They can have babies till they die. They have one baby per mating event, which takes a period of 8 months. Interbirth period of 12 months. And breeding them is pretty easy. So uh, a redneck wallaby joey uh, measures 2 centimeters to 2.5 centimeters of birth and only weighs 1 gram, it's very small. They have multiple stomach chambers similar to ruminants like cattle, which allows them to regurgitate food and chew uh, and swallow it again, which is pretty cool. Alb albinism also appears occasionally in species. There's one population of the subspecies living in Tasmania that's entirely um, albinistic. I'm not sure how true that is, but that's pretty interesting. The milk of the redneck wallaby changes composition to match the current development needs of the joey. That happens with a lot of marsupials. Uh, red-necked wallabies can independently rotate their ears up to 180 degrees to pick up the sound of predators. So that's also really cool. And they like to hang out with red kangaroos and our next animal, the emu. So let's get talking about these emus. So another Australian animal. Let's look at these little guys. I really do love these guys. So this is the emu. So these guys are the second tallest living bird, uh, and they're relative to the ostrich. They're only found in Australia, and they're the largest native bird there. And in terms of their size and description, these guys, are, as I mentioned, the second tallest bird. Largest individuals can get between 150 and 190 centimeters, or 59 to 75 centimeters in height. Uh, inches in height, I mean. Though, if you measure them from bill to tail, they get about 139 to 164 centimeters or 55 to 65 inches in length. With males averaging a little bit smaller than the females, females are typically a little bigger. And they're the fourth to fifth uh, heaviest bird alive today, second only to pretty much the two species of ostriches and the cassowaries, though they weigh slightly more than the emperor penguin. So that's why they kind of get, get their point. And they weigh between 18 to 60 kilograms or 40 to 130 pounds. Where they average about 31 to 37 kilo, uh, kilograms or about 69 to 82 pounds of males and females. And they do have small wings as you kind of see here. The vestigial wings. They can't really fly like that. But you can see these really long uh, feathers that they have. But they have the long legs and stuff that allow them to move across the outback. They can actually have quite large strides. They have a strides of about like a... a 100 centimeters or three feet but a full stride can be like nine feet if they really start running which is really really interesting and you can also see here the eyes are protected by a nictating membrane and the neck of the emu as you can see is pale blue and they have this sparse patterning as well it could be like a signal thing even though females are a little bit not, not too different in appearance and it can vary a lot due to the environment and they also have you can see this gray brown plumage and this really shaggy appearance what i think makes them look really interesting and these really big toes very very awesome so, uh, as I mentioned, these guys are typically once common across the east coast of Australia. They're now uncommon there, but they pretty much can be found all across Australia, both inland and near the coast. They can be found in savannah woodlands and places like that. 
Uh, and they, though they predominantly move around in pairs, they can be found on large flocks as well, as they move to find new food sources, things like that, which is really, really interesting. And these guys are also diurnal birds, so they spend their day foraging, preening with their beaks, and dust bathing and resting. And they're generally gregarious, apart from the breeding season where they go off and find their own thing, uh, to have babies, of course. And the emus will settle down at sunset, sunset and deep during the night. And they do not sleep continuously, but they will rouse themselves a couple of times during the night. Um, the vocalations of emus are also very interesting. They have various booming and grunting sounds, which actually probably a lot of what dinosaurs would have sound like. A great example of that there. Really chilling, I think. Really interesting. And um, also on very hot days, they're actually able to maintain their bo body temperature. And unlike some of the species, they can... Um, it will kind of evaporate coolers, that's how their lungs work, but some species, the resulting low level of carbon dioxide does not really cause them to get like poisoning or anything. So it's a really interesting adaptation that they have to allow them to uh, survive in the desert. And in terms of diet, these guys are, as I mentioned, diurnal. They feed on all sorts of grasses, but they'll feed on insects, many different types of invertebrates, like millipedes, spiders, ladybugs, cockroaches, things like that. And one thing as well is that they'll also swallow... Uh, little sto small stones called gastrolus that helps them digest their food and they may have up to uh, 745 grams or like 1.6 pounds of stones in the gu uh, gizzard that allows them to, to help digest things they've also been known to eat shards of glass car keys nuts and bolts and marbles as a part of like putting it in their gizzard to help digest and in terms of breeding these guys will form breeding pairs in the summer uh, months of december to january and they may remain together for about five months or so as you can see this is a female let's see if we find a male males are a little bit smaller let's see if we find them there we are there's a male he's a bit of a cutie i do say so myself um anyway both male and females will put on weight during the breeding season with females being slightly heavier and then the males are slightly smaller Mating will take place between april and june and it depends where they are in australia and the climate when this exact mating will happen and the males will construct a nest of a semi-sheltered hollow in the ground using bark, gravel, and leaves and things like that. And um, they could actually be up to like 7 centimeters tall in a big spherical area. And the female will, uh, emu will court the males and kind of do their thing. Uh, as the females will actually have feather the skin just below the eyes that will kind of turn turquoise blue. But the males kind of stay more or less the same. They call to each other and then they kind of will courtship and then have stuff in each other. And if the male is interested, he'll stretch his neck to erect his feathers. And they kind of get down and do the dirty. Typically females are more aggressive during this uh, breeding season because of uh, they were fighting for access to males and things like that. So it's kind of opposite than a lot of species, which is interesting. Uh, but um, once they... Typically, get down and do the dirty. They have about six eggs that are kind of really big. They're about one millimeter thickness of the shell, but they get between uh, around 13 centimeters by nine centimeters, or five inches by three inches wide, and weigh about 450 to 650 grams. And also have these like green eggs that really uh, look interesting. And they probably have a long incubation period as well. So they have an incubation period uh, that's, I believe, about longer than most other birds of that size as well. And um, when they're born, they're a little more, 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 more precocial, so they'll be able to come out and run around, so they have that long incubation to compensate. Uh, the males will become broody after his mate starts laying and may begin to incubate the eggs before the clutches actually compete. And then um, they'll have incubate over that course of eight weeks as well. And they will have a bond and do things like that. And some, and some actually female emus will actually parasite other eggs. They'll lay their eggs and with a... Uh, another male emu to uh, basically help make him raise her babies unknowingly, which is quite interesting. And some females will stay and defend the nest until the chicks start hatching, and then she'll go off and do her thing. And sometimes in a good year, she'll even nest up to three times. But um, typically, they're, kind of, they're born the precursor emus to kind of uh, come out, and then they will uh, be active and leave the nest. They stand about 5 inches or 12 centimeters tall when they're born, and about half a kilogram. Uh, and then they grow very quickly in their five to six months of life where they walk around with their father and potentially their mother as well and they kind of walk around do their thing and then once they get big enough they run off and do their own thing and um, they can live up to 10 years of captivity in terms of their predators though there's not very many predators uh, historically they would have been preyed on by megalania, potentially thylacines and lots of carnivorous marsupials now they pretty much prey for dingoes and babies can be like uh, eating 
like wedge tailed eagles, uh, raptors, uh, monitor lizards, uh, feral dogs and domestic dogs, even pigs will eat emus and small chicks and eggs and things like that. Yeah, really, really interesting. Humans have a very interesting relationship with these guys. If you guys heard of the Great Emu War, basically we went to war with emus and lost, which is very interesting. But they've had a great impact on our culture because people eat them and they also use um, faddish bush medicine and people like to use their feathers as like coats and things like that. Uh, lots of different things. And it's also cultural references into their uh, in Australian culture, which is really interesting because they're such cool animals. Let's have a look at these cute little babies while we uh, move on. And um, in terms of like their conservation, their populations are considered least concerned. They've been doing quite well. Now, there are some subspecies slash species of emus, like the Tasmanian emu or the King Island emu, that have gone extinct due to hunting. But now they're considered doing okay. And actually thought to be uh, the population of emus in Australia is thought to be higher than before people came along. So that's very interesting. And look at you. You're a cutie, aren't you? So uh, let's have a look at the... Um, Zoopedia. So you yeah, can see that population in the wild, 6,300 to 7,250,000. So that's quite interesting. They're not endangered in a class of least concern. That there is uh, certain regions where they have gone extinct. Um, you can see that wide range there. They used to live in Tasmania and Kangaroo Island, places like that. Uh, at one to six, so up to five males and females. Bachelor groups can be up to six. Hens caught males. No dominant structure outside breeding season, though. They're polygamous or polyandrous. Um, the relation to humans are confident and guests can be the habitat no which is weird because uh, there's a lot of walkthrough enclosures in zoos in australia that ha you can walk in and say with the emus which is pretty cool um females are slightly large you can see there 1.75 uh, meters tall and the males 1.65 live for about 15 years or so females are slightly heavier about 47 kilograms males about 42.5 kilograms uh, age of sexual maturity is about 1.5 years, so they're able to have babies till they die. They have one to five babies per uh, offspring or mating event. Uh, three months gestation, that's about eight weeks or so, two months, three months. Uh, and the birth period is about 12 months, and they're quite easy to reproduce in captivity, which is good. Uh, they're quite fast as well. Um, they can reach top speeds of 48 kilometers an hour. Emu males incubate their eggs at the and care for the chicks. The emu has two sets of eyelids. One is using is visible use for blinking. The other is called the nectating membrane, which is transparent and used to protect from dust and things like that. And the only bird species with calf muscles, which is very interesting. And um, in the 1930s, the Australian government attempted to utilize the military to cull emus that were migrating through farmland in the Great Emu War. And they lost that war. So that's a very funny fact about uh, these emus. And you can see they're like hanging out with the redneck wallaby and the red kangaroo. So this is our last one for our part one of our uh, uh, grass and animal pack kind of animal review. So let's have a look at the blue wildebeest. And while we, is this the male? No, it's a female. We'll have a look at you while you do your thing. So the blue wildebeest, also known as the common wildebeest or the white bearded uh, gnu. So these guys are a type of large antelope and one of the two species of wildebeest along with the black wildebeest. Um, these guys are, as you can see, they've got the very uh, muscular front head appearance with that robust muzzle and these kind of stripes down its uh, neck and side there, which is really, really interesting. Uh, young uh, blue wildebeest are actually born tawny brown, as you can kind of see there, and then they develop these adult colors with uh, these bluish gray and light grays on them. So these guys are also a herbivore, so they feed primarily on short grasses, things like that. And they often will form herds or loose aggregations that could be quite huge during the rainy season, which is pretty awesome. Let's see what we can talk about. So typically in terms of size, these guys do exhibit sexual dimorphism. Males will be larger and darker than females, with blue wildebeest typically being 170 to 240 centimeters or 67 to 94 inches in head to body length, with the average of the species kind of being... Uh, about the average height of the species 115 to 145 centimeters or 45 to 57 inches males will typically weigh between 165 to 290 kilograms or about 364 to 639 pounds and females a little bit smaller about 140 to 260 kilograms or 310 to 570 pounds and you can see that quite interesting coloration there they have an average lifespan of about 20 years in the wild and about 21 years of captivity with the oldest known captive individual living up to about 24 years but um, really, really awesome. You can see they've got these broad parents and that really distinct, route, a rough, uh, robust uh, muzzle to them. And this long kind of mane to them as well. 
you can kind of see they get the name the Bartle Gnu from like the uh, vertical stripes uh, around the uh, rib cage. Almost looks like it's got a bridle on. Really interesting look. Also, this quite large um, kind of what you, what you call it mane and also this beard or goatee, which is really interesting. And both sexes have um, large horns here. As you can see they're like parentheses, and um, these horns can be up to about 83 centimeters or 33 inches long. And though in females is about 30 to 40 centimeters, 12 to 16 inches long. And though they are antelope, they have a lot of convergent evolution with bovines, some do just similar ecologies. And they kind of look similar, even though they're not related to uh, bovids at all, the type of antelope. Is this the male? Yeah, this is the male. I'm going to look at you since you're big and interesting. You can see he's a little bit bigger. So uh, in terms of their behavior, these guys are most active during the morning and late afternoon. With the hottest part of the day, they kind of sleep around. They're very weary animals, but can run up to 8 kilometers an hour, 50 miles per hour, where they raid their tails and uh, cross their heads. Um, lots of studies show that they spend a lot of their time grazing and moving around with some little social interactions. And um, they usually rest close to each other in loose aggregations. Males will form uh, bachelor herds and they can be distinguished by the lower amount of activity from like younger bachelor herds. And about 90% of the male calves will join a bachelor herd before the next breeding season. And bulls can be territorial at the age of 4 or 5 years old and become very noisy. And um, they often uh, have territories with the temperature, uh, with the ter uh, most territories are kind of uh, temporary and they will, fewer than half the males will actually hold permanent territories. They kind of just have a territory where they find them. And um, they can be within a minimum of like one to two meters of these individuals. And these guys also are a major prey item for animals such as lions, cheetahs, leopards, wild dogs, hyenas, and crocodiles. In terms of uh, breeding, while well, we have a with the cute little babies, Oh, no, that's not what we wanted to do. Typically, these little guys will hang around for their mothers and other related females throughout their lives, with female individuals in a herd have range names of uh, ages, from yearlings to the oldest cows. Uh, during the wet season, the females will generally lead the herd through uh, nutritious areas of grass where predators can be avoided, and this is essential for the survival of the young calves. And um, bulls and the boundaries will mark their territories uh, with heaps of dung and sink glands and use certain behaviours. And the body language they'll use, especially as a territorial male, they'll use like a uh, erect standing, erect pose, they'll paw the ground and um, shake their heads and make the gnu sounds that they're kind of famous for. But in terms of diet, these guys are herbivores, so they typically feed on short grasses that commonly grow in light and alkaline soils across the savannah grasslands. And they often can be found associated with plain zebras, with the uh, uh, wildebeest eating the less nutritious grass canopy and then the kind of... Uh, with the plain zebras kind of eating the uh, upper, less nutritious grass, and then the, the wildebeest coming in and kind of eating the uh, more green material, the lower material that the wildebeest prefer. And whenever possible, they like to drink twice a day, and they can drink up to 12 liters uh, once every two days, or one or two days, which is quite interesting. In terms of their uh, sexual maturity and all that reproduction and stuff, they become sexually matured at about two years of age. Let's see if I can find them there. Let's have a look. They get sexually matured at about two years of age, and females can conceive in 16 months if they're adequately nourished. Uh, nevertheless, most females do not uh, breed until they're like three years old or so. The mating season lasts about three weeks, which coincides the end of the uh, rainy season. That means animals are in good condition, things like that, and then the testosterone will happen, and the males will kind of maintain their territories and uh, fight each other for behavior as well. And then they'll clash, they'll bend knees and kind of clash each other and things like that. They'll snort and bellow and dig and then they will tussle with each other as well. But um, once the top male kind of gets his uh, chance, he will mount the female and obviously copulate. And then once gestation period happens or once the baby's conceived, it's about eight and a half months uh, of gestation. And between 80 to 90 calves are born within a three week time period, which is pretty interesting. Females uh, will the beast for good birth in the middle of a herd rather than alone, and typically in the middle of the day. This allows time for the newborn to be steady on its feet uh, once before night falls, and then predators become more active. At birth, these young calves can be born about 19 kilograms or 42 pounds, and they're able to usually stand up on their own within a few minutes of birth. And to escape predation, calves will remain close to their mothers uh, for a significant time and continue suckling until their next year's calf is born. Uh, and the males will leave their mothers at about eight months and form herds with other juvenile males. And in large female herds, 80% of the offspring will survive the first month, and compared to the 50 survival rates in uh, smaller herds. 
So as I mentioned, these guys are kind of native to lots of areas in southern uh, Africa. They can be found in Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, Mozambique, Zambia, South Africa, Itswani, and Angola. But they are distinct, uh, extinct in Malawi and have been successfully reintroduced into uh, Namibia as well. And they prefer the kind of short grasses, things like that. And they often take parts of uh, long-distance migrations, especially across the Setengiri and the Kafule, things like that, which has uh, been interesting to study. In terms of uh, threats and conservation, though, they are believe uh, they are considered least concern. There were lots of issues uh, with these guys, especially with um, diseases from cattle spreading to these guys, which really sucked. And even some areas, populations like declined up to 80 percent. So about 119,000 individuals in 1977 on the Masai Mara to about 20 years later, only 22,000. But luckily, due to uh, good vaccination campaigns. Uh, the populations of wildebeest were able to recover, and now they're doing okay. And the total number of blue wildebeest estimated living in the world is about 1.5 million, uh, with the population trend being stable, so they are considered pretty much uh, considered least concern. Though there are some subspecies that are kind of a little bit worried about that. And in relationship to humans, they're one of the major herbivores in southern eastern Africa, and they draw a lot of tourists and area to observe big game. And um, they also can be affected by humans because of livestock and transmit diseases like that. But um, they seem to be a quite interesting animal and they seem to be doing okay. Really, really do love them. So let's have a look in the Zoopedia. As I mentioned, like one and a half million is the estimate. And um, they live around Africa. You can see uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. They're like groups 4 to 20 with one male up to 19 females. Bachelor groups can be 4 to 9. Females can be 4 to 20. Dominance is territorial bulls. Uh, female hierarchy is within the herd. They're polyg polygamous. Uh, their relation to humans is neutral, and they will not guess kind into the habitat because they're quite big animals still. Their size is about 1.3 meters tall at the shoulder for males, 1.2 meters tall, 1.25 meters tall at the shoulder for females. About 18 years they live for, and weight for a males 227 kilograms on average, with females being on average 200 kilograms. Uh, they reach sexual maturity about four years old. They can have babies till they die. They have one baby per offspring kind of um, uh, interval or one period, one baby. The gestation period is about eight months. Uh, interbirth period is about 12 months, and they're very easy to breed in captivity. So in terms of uh, fun facts, blue wildebeest are so named because their coat has a blue sheen in it. That's also true. They're known to migrate over 1,000 miles every year to cross two rivers and to do so. Uh, up to 90% of blue wildebeest, ice, uh, blue wildebeest offspring are all born within a two-week birthing period, as I mentioned that before. They're often seen in herds with plain zebra. The two species don't compete for food as the zebra prefer long grass, and the wildebeest can then, then graze on the shorter grasses. And not all blue wildebeest migrate. Some female groups form closely bonded resident herds and will feed stay in the same area all year round. just depends on the population and herds that you talk about. Not all of them do these big migrations. Uh, which is pretty much what they're saying. And being a savannah Afri animal, they hang out with a lot of animals like the plain zebra, the wildebeest, the black wildebeest, Thompson's gazelle, springbok, uh, giraffes and rhinos, things like that. But um, yeah, really, really awesome. So that's our first part done for the grasslands animal pack. A really, really awesome pack and I can't wait to get stuck into the rest of the species next time. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get that little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe and bye-bye.